was. Goat meat, that's what it was, now that I remember. So, yeah, goat meat. Didn't, that was yours, Chuck. I get, get <laughs> Okay, so uh, how many of you have their handout from last week? Okay, some of you do. So I made some handouts here of where we left off. So if you didn't bring one, this is where we left off. So raise your hand. Perry will come around and give you one. If, for those of you who don't know Perry, Perry is the pastor up at uh, Hilltop Christian Church in um, hmm. Yeah, it's up at Lake Nacimiento. No, hold on to those. Uh, can you go up to pins? Yeah. Yes, I, 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 see, I see that hand. Did you want to come forward? <laughs> yeah, that's where we left off. I have it on reliable sources. That's where we left off. And, and feel free anytime that we're, uh, oh, thank you, Kurt. Feel free anytime we're talking or whatever. Oh, money jar, I think, is uh, right here in my pocket. No. It's uh, back there. I think it's, uh, does it say donations on it or whatever? Warren's got it. Oh, boy. He's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that offering, Warren. <laughs> okay. Let me just uh, open up our time in study and prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the words that you give us in Scripture of your imminent return, Lord. We look forward to it. We know there's many signs that have to take place before you return. And so, Lord, as we think about these things and we look at them, Father, may we be very much in anticipation, but not acting foolishly, but acting wisely and prudently to be able to see the signs, to be able to understand what you're going to do, and then to be ready, most important, for your imminent return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was a, when I went in to order the burritos yesterday, there was about five or six cowboys sitting at a table in the very back. They all had their cowboy hats, you know, on the, hanging up. And I, and I decided to have some fun with them because I knew a couple of them. And I, I went up to one of them, and I just said to them, I, I, you know, as they were sitting there in a the group, I said, guys, I'm really sorry your, your presidential candidate lost. <laughs> and you should have heard those guys. <laughs> they went crazy. But uh, anyway, we had a fun time. But uh, what's really interesting uh, about the election is uh, just the entire movement against the woke community, you know, and as I was looking at that, and then I started to think about what does a Trump presidency look like, particularly in relationship to Israel, which is part of God's plan, and what is it going to look like with Russia and the war in Ukraine, and so those are pretty big differences right there. So I listened to a national security advisor and a guy who was a retired four-star general, and he basically said that the reason that the war is lasting as long as it is against Hamas is because, in his opinion, the Biden administration only gives them enough ammunition to kind of keep it at a, a slow pace. Um, because he was saying had they had the opportunity 
to do what they wanted to do, it would have been over in 30 days or so. And so it makes me wonder, with Trump now going to be president, what's that situation going to look like? Is he going to green light the war that's going on in the north with Hezbollah? Because Hamas in the south is pretty much already deteriorated and gone. And that will be very interesting. But the other thing that he is, uh, Biden has held back is any retaliation against uh, Iran. And they're the ones who are, you know, funding so much of the terrorism. Uh, the Biden administration has allowed them to open up the pipeline in Iran and sell the oil. And they're selling between 60 and 70 million barrels a day, making millions and millions of dollars. And that, that's what allows them to fund the terrorism. And so if he shuts that off or gives the green light to the Israeli Air Force to go in there and take out the reactors, that's going to be a very different world, isn't it? So I kind of wonder at times, things can change on a dime, can't they? And that's the whole point of the second coming. You, you look at these signs and you begin to understand whether Christ can come or not at any moment. And everything looks peaceful. Everything looks fantastic. Everything looks great. No one's alarmed. And then all of a sudden, at a, in a moment of time, boom, it happens. And I, li I liken it to this. I liken the. I was thinking about how am I going to describe the the coming of Christ, uh, anticipating the signs that are yet to come, and then looking at the fullness of the signs when they get here. I thought of a, a, a illustration. I don't know if it helps you, but it helps me. So, uh, we've all been to the beach, right? And uh, I. I, uh, I have to be careful because uh, I love the beach, but at the same time, I, I'm, a, I'm a white Irish guy. So, you know, I come in two colors, white and red. That's it. I don't, I don't get tan. I go out there and I burn. So if you see a guy with a, you know, a SP shirt over him and a hat and smothered in white, that's me. I'm floating out there. So when I was walking out to the beach in Hawaii, I was surprised just how powerful a little tiny wave could be. It doesn't have to be a lot, but that pull and that undertow of the wave. So it hits you and, and you wobble, it hits you and you wobble more. Then you take a few more steps out and it's a bigger wave and it really hits you and you wobble. Then you just go out a few more feet and bam, it hits you and knocks you over. And when we're looking at the signs of our Lord Jesus Christ returning, that's kind of how I think of each of these events. They're like little waves that shake the world, that move us, but then they progress as they go to the ultimate climax when that tsunami comes, right? And it just wipes everything out in its path, and that's kind of like the Lord's second coming. So we've been looking at the signs of his return, and then we started to... Uh, I'm on the top, uh, I probably should tell you where I am, uh, under B, Great Tribulation. Do you see that? Okay, so if you see that, that's, that's where I am today. So the signs of tribulation are, uh, what page is that for those of you who've got the handout? 19, okay. Yeah, 19. That's what I thought it was. And he's going through the language of Scripture trying to help us understand the coming of the Lord because, believe it or not, the, there is a major view out there called preterism. And I, I know it's kind of like, oh boy, here's another word I have to learn. But preterism just kind of means the last things. But they look at the Bible and they say all the signs have already been fulfilled. And the Lord could come at any moment because all the signs have been fulfilled. And they even go so far, some of them, to say that the Lord has actually returned. And I'm like, boy, if this is the millennial kingdom, are we in trouble? I mean, good heavens. So we got to be careful because the signs like waves escalate. They start slow, right? And there may be periods in history where it really seems like the Lord is going to return. And then all of a sudden... It goes back down, and then the next one is higher and higher and higher we go 
until he returns. But what we have to understand is that when he does return, according to what the scripture says, it is not going to be a silent day. It is going to be spectacular when he returns. The, the Bible is very clear in the language of the coming of him and his judgment that is to happen and take place. So much so that, depending upon your point of view, uh, the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise. I mean, that seems like a cataclysmic event to me. And I've often told people when I'm doing a service out at Paso Robles Cemetery or any of the cemeteries, and the Lord's going to return. I, I, I want him to return the day that I'm doing that service right then and there. I want to watch those graves open up and the saints of God just rise up. And it's like, woo, I'm ready to go. That would be awesome. So he's arguing here on, and you got page 19b says the great tribulation. And so he's now saying, and just to catch us up, he's now saying what, what signs need to come and why haven't some of these things taken place? And do they mean ultimately the coming of Christ? So look at B, Great Tribulation. It seems likely that the language of Scripture indicates a period of suffering coming to earth that is far greater than anything else we've experienced. So Christ couldn't have come yet just simply because tribulation across the world hasn't happened. Now, let's be careful here because we're talking as Americans in the West and we don't understand our brothers in China. There's over 300 million Christians in China and some of them meet in small rooms and places to worship. I was uh, talking to a pastor who went there to train Chinese nationalists and he had 12 of them. They went to a hotel. They all went incognito. They basically got to the hotel, they checked a couple of rooms and moved into those rooms, and they had a third room where they all gathered together. And so you got, you know, 15 of these people in a room, jam-packed, a hotel room. One guy speaking, and the pastor told me, he says, you don't speak for 45 minutes and then take a break, and then start again and take a break. and take." He says, you start early in the morning and you go till it's dark. They won't give you a break. That's how hungry they are. And he was talking to the people that are in the room, the 15 or 16 of those who are in the room, the different Chinese, and he was asking, how many people are in your group where you live that are believers? And most of them gave an answer of a couple of million people. So these are like regional pastors who have a couple of million people that they represent. And they were so hungry for God's word. And then as they finally closed the session out and they began to pray, he, one of the Chinese people turned to the pastor there and he says, pray that we could be like America, where we have the freedom to be able to worship, the freedom to meet. And the pastor thought about it for a moment and he says, I won't pray that prayer. He says, I, I, I'll pray for your religious freedom, but I'm not going to pray a prayer that says, I want you to be like America. Because we teach all day here in America, we can't even get people at times to show up on a weekend service. You guys pray, and when you pray, you pray for hours. Americans don't do that. But when you guys go all out for Christ and are willing to suffer, you do that. Americans won't. And I thought that was really interesting how he analyzed American culture and our understanding of Christianity compared to a country that goes through all kinds of tribulation. So he said, I will pray for you that you get freedom, but don't come like us, don't get soft, be tough and stay tough, because that's what persecution does, doesn't it? I started thinking about ministry, and the best times of spiritual growth in ministry have been times of suffering. And Peter knows what that's about, and he writes it in his first and second little epistles there about suffering and how much God grows us. I hate suffering. I hate going through it. But when I've gone through it, on the other side, I'm tried, I'm tested, I'm proven, and I'm stronger than I was before. And I don't know. I was kind of 
you know, it, it, in the backside of my mind, not knowing who was going to win the election, part of me was saying, you know, if Kamala Harris had won the election, maybe it would have been tougher in America to become or to actually step forward and say, I'm a believer. Maybe tribulation would have started happening and that would have purified the church. I don't know. That's the future for the Lord to decree and to decide. But it sure makes it interesting, doesn't it? So the Bible tells us there's going to be great tribulation. And if you drop down, it says, but it must be realized that many interpreters throughout history have understood the warnings refer to the Roman siege of Jerusalem back in 66 or 70 AD. So there are those people, and these are the word, that's the word I'm going to use again, preterism, that look at everything already being fulfilled, and they see the great tribulation and the difficulty that happened in 70 AD when Titus, under uh, he, he was father was Vespasian, who became an emperor, and then Titus ruled, and he literally destroyed Israel. I mean, everything, that, there was not one stone standing upon another. So you got your Bible, just turn over to Matthew chapter 24 for just a minute. And I want to I show you what Jesus is talking about here. Matthew chapter 24. It's a great passage of scripture because it deals with the end times. So beginning at verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was uh, going away when his disciples came and point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he said to them, you see all, uh, I've got a light print Bible here, I'm going to have to get close. <laughs> but he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And then in my Bible, it's got a, a little heading that says, Signs of the End Age. He sat down on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us what these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed for this must take place. But the end is not yet. So he's saying wave after wave of turmoil on the earth is going to take place, but it's still not the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, earthquakes in various places. And then he says, all this is just the beginning of the birth pains. So you women who have children, you know what birth pains is. It starts at slow and easy, and then next thing you know, boom. And then the child comes, and it's a tough time. And what Jesus is saying is the birth pains have already begun. They've already begun. But some look at this passage of Scripture and say it's already been fulfilled. It's already taken place. It's already happened. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. They'll put you to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my sake. Many will fall away. What he means by falling away is they'll recant the faith and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Because of lawlessness will be what? Increased and the love of many will go cold. I think if there's anything, any mark of uh, the woke movement, it's lawlessness. Defund the police, anarchy, do whatever you want to do. That's your ultimate expression of freedom. So what Jesus is talking about is this succession of waves that is going to come, but none of them will actually fully be the tribulation until that moment when it actually happens and look out what it do when it does. So he's letting us know that we are going to see difficult times and a lot of suffering. So drop down to where it says, in fact, the first century, there have been many periods of violent and intense persecution of Christians, even in our lifetime, right? Much has occurred over large portions of the globe with Christians being horribly persecuted in the former Soviet Union, in communist China, in North Korea, 
and Muslim countries. So these are the places where if you're a Christian, you're like, yeah, tribulation has begun and I'm right in the middle of it. It would be difficult to convince some Christians today who have undergone decades of persecution for their faith and have known that persecution known that persecution to affect thousands of other Christians throughout large segments of the world, that such a great tribulation has certainly not yet occurred. So understand that some think tribulation is here, it is in part of the world, but if I read my Bible correctly, there is going to be a tribulation on the face of this earth that is going to surmount every other difficulty that you can possibly imagine. And when Matthew 24, when you read the full context of it and listen to what Jesus says, it is going to be one heck of a rough time. And I know that's a hard sell for Christians, right? To be able to sit here and say, hey, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. How bad's the worst? Really bad. And it's going to get really bad just before Christ comes. So we need to beware. They've longed and prayed for years for Christ to come to rescue them for the tribulation they're enduring. Therefore, Though we may think of Jesus' words indicates the likelihood of yet greater persecution coming in the future, it's difficult when to be certain of this. We just don't know. We just don't know. I mean, stop and think about it. If you were to talk to Christians at the time of World War II under the regime of Nazi, where they were actually rounding up Jews, not only Jews, but other kinds of groups of people, and putting them to death, those people living in that time would have looked at that and said, this is tribulation. This is what we're going through. And many of them did. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great man of God, Lutheran, who uh, was brilliant, was a seminary professor, was in New York teaching. And when the war started, he determined that he was not going to stay in America and be comfortable. He went back to Germany, in Nazi Germany, he went back and led the underground church movement and suffered and persecuted tremendously, arrested in the last few months of World War II and executed two weeks before Hitler committed suicide and the Nazi regime came down. Now, here's a guy who didn't run away from it. He said, I'm going to run towards it because there's people who need to know Christ. He wrote a book. Well, he wrote several books, but he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. If you ever get a copy of that, read it. Now, he's coming from a Lutheran perspective, but nevertheless, it's a good book. So, C, here's the other thing, false Christs and false prophets. With regard to false Christs and false prophets who will work signs and wonders, any missionary who has worked among people where witchcraft and demonic activity are rampant will already testify to the miraculous signs and wonders that have been worked frequently by demonic powers in opposition to, uh, to spread of the gospel. How many of you know Joe Shetler? Joe Shetler is our missionary to the Philippines. She's now in Waxhaw. She just, I think she just turned 85, didn't she? Incre incredible gal. 88? She's older than I thought. <laughs> 88 years old, and she is still going strong. She is still out sharing Jesus, doing her Christ meets culture uh, and scripture seminar around the globe. But she will tell you, when she was back in the Philippines in the jungles, the demonic things that she saw, uh, the, the things that supposed faith healers did that actually were healings, but they were demonic in nature. And so when you see demonic signs, be very, very careful. When you see somebody who claims to do miraculous, be very careful because the enemy can fake it just like the magicians did in Pharaoh's court. Demonic miracles, false signs have been done for centuries. At least since that time of the magicians in Pharaoh's court produced false signs and miracles, right? You remember when he cast his staved down and it turned into a snake and they cast theirs down and it became a snake and then the good part was what his snake ate the other snakes which i like that the activity of simon the sorcerer is another one and whatever the specific form it takes such working 
of deceptive miracles is always accompanied by false religions, leading many people astray. So we have this quote here, children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that Antichrist is coming. Now, if you want to circle a word, here it comes. So now many Antichrists, you can circle that word, have come. That lets me know that there's going to be one Antichrist who is going to come, but there's going to be a lot of fakes going on, and that's why he uses the plural term, Antichrists. It seems likely, it seems likely that Jesus' words predict a far greater manifestation of this kind of activity in the time just prior to his return. It's difficult to be certain that this will be so, but it is best to conclude that it is unlikely, that is, we're not here just yet, but still possible that this sign has been fulfilled already. So when we're looking at signs, we've got to be very, very careful, very careful. So I just, uh, going through the Gospel of Mark, and turn to Mark's Gospel, if you will, chapter 9. I was just thinking about this last night. Mark chapter 9, that's where we're going to be tomorrow morning. And the very opening verses is the transfiguration, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a high mountain, Mount Hermon, 9,000 feet in the air above the tree line. It's got snow on it most of the time, and he takes them to a high mountain. The Bible tells us in Luke's gospel that Jesus was there and the disciples were sleeping typical disciple right just like in the garden of gethsemane when jesus needs them the most they're snoozing it away so they're sleeping and then he transfigures in front of them now can you imagine that and mark describes it as a cloud that overshadowed them and his clothes became brilliant white so if somebody was to take you to a high mountain and say you want to see something really cool and then they showed you this light show, this, this incredible transfiguration. And they were to say to you, I am the Messiah. What would you say? Wait a minute. Is it possible? A lot of people would say, yeah, go for it. But remember what Scripture says? Scripture says even Satan himself can appear as an angel of light and deceive people. Now, go over to 2 Peter for just a moment. Let me just show you a, a passage here. We're going to cover it more thoroughly tomorrow, but 2 Peter chapter 1. Is that in the New Testament, by the way? <laughs> These pages are so thin. Second Peter chapter 1. So he's encouraging them. Drop down to verse 16. Peter is writing and he says, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So, so what's, he, what's he referring to here? What's he talking about? He's talking about the, the transformation, isn't he? For when he received honor and glory from the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So w would that be awesome? I mean, wouldn't you want to have been there? Peter, James, and John, the three most trusted part of his disciples in the inner circle to see the incredible transfiguration. Now watch this. This is all connected together. Verse 19. And we have the prophet's word more fully confirmed. To which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Here's what he's saying. I had that experience of the transfiguration. I was there. 
But you need to understand in verse 9, you have a prophetic word. That's God's word. That's the Bible. And what he says here is that prophetic word is more firmly confirmed. In other words, even though you weren't there, the word of God is just as great as a powerful testimony and a witness to who Jesus is as what we encountered on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he's letting us know that signs, anybody can fake signs, wonders, miracles. But if they don't align up with God's word, like the Mount Transfiguration where Jesus appeared, be careful because you could be paying attention to false prophets and false signs. Some of these healers that go around the country healing people, and they, they, some of them are, are healed, genuinely healed. And they have no explanation for it. But when they go off the deep end and they begin to talk about Jesus Christ and they begin to lead people astray from who Jesus is and lead them away from his word, the more certain confirmed word is right here in God's word, the scripture. So this takes precedence over any experience that anybody has. That's the main point. This Word of God is more significant than somebody's experience. Kent. Magnify the word above everything. Absolutely. So, though these people can experience these things, trust me, those experiences, if they're not in line with the word of God, doctrinal error is about to happen. And we do see this. And I've, I've had some people tell me some pretty credible experiences and and they they could that could they could be real they could the things that they saw the th the healing that took place I'm not saying god can't do that but we don't put our faith in those things we put our faith in his word and in jesus christ and if those things come alongside and confirm the word of god you can believe it but don't get caught up in all of these miraculous things that people claim out there because Powerful signs are not always part of the kingdom. Now, listen, listen to these powerful signs. Notice the, what I have highlighted in the dark. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Wow, that's a sign, wouldn't you say? Now, a guy by the name of Robert Thomas France says, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven is nothing more than symbolic. I don't think his argument is very persuasive. I think God tries to give us the best that he can. I know sometimes it's figurative language, but I think he's letting us know the truth. For the stars in the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. That's from Isaiah. So this doesn't need to be understood as a symbol of God's judgment. It's more likely that in Isaiah and Matthew 24, because Jesus says the same thing in Matthew chapter 24, speak of yet a literal falling of the stars and a blackening of the sun and moon. Well, if the sun goes out, the moon goes out too, doesn't it, right? Because it just reflects the glory. Something that would be suitable, prelude to the shaking of the earth and the heaven and the cosmic destruction that will come after the return of Christ. So you've got pretty incredible signs taking place in the constellations which is amazing to me. Moreover, this is significant that this description of cosmic events, that's in Matthew 24, followed in the rest of the sentence with the description of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. France, that's the author, must take this not as a description of Christ's literal return, but as you will see, he takes it as a description of Jerusalem and what happened in 70 A.D., so he just sits back and he looks at all this prophetic stuff and he says it's just symbolism. But drop down to the next paragraph. It is better to regard them as literal signs that will occur just before Christ's return. 
So literally, those things, I believe, are going to take place just before Jesus returns. They will occur before his return, and as such, they fall into a different category from other signs since it seems certain that they have not occurred yet. They haven't occurred yet. Nonetheless, hang on, they could occur very quickly within the space of a few minutes or in the most of an hour or two. So if we've got a lot of signs of tribulation and trial, raging, war, famine, all of this is going to take place, then just before his return, I believe, is when we will see these signs coming to fulfillment. We'll see just perhaps within a few minutes, maybe an hour or two when the sun is completely blotted out. What happened at the death of Jesus, by the way? You remember that? Darkness. And no one could explain it. You know, I know some liberals try to say, oh, it was a solar eclipse. You know, really? Total darkness, solar eclipse, three hours long? Now, here's one of the other things that takes place. I want you to get this. The appearance of the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. So there's going to be a person who is coming on the face of this earth who is going to claim peace, peace, but no peace will be given. And he will oppose himself to everything that is a believer. Many attempts have been made throughout history to identify the men of lawlessness, the Antichrist, historical figures who have had great authority and brought havoc and decimation. Here's a few of them. Nero, right? Domitian, he was another guy that brought the Antichrist. Many Roman emperors, these two, particularly Nero and Domitian, wanted to be worshipped as deity themselves. In more recent times, Adolf Hitler was thought to be the Antichrist, Joseph Stalin. On the other hand, many Protestants since the Reformation, especially those who were persecuted by the Catholic Church, have thought one or another of the popes was the Antichrist. And believe me, if you could see the evil that goes on in the papacy, it is at times unbelievable the stuff that they have hidden, the lives that they leave. One of the things that really surprises me about this current pope, uh, it's not Ratzinger, what's this guy's name now? The new guy? Anybody know? I can't remember his name. Is it Francis? Okay, so he's the, he's the current pope, but he has gone on record saying that it doesn't really matter what religion you are, even the Islam, Muslim, whatever, Jew, whatever, they're all passed to lead you to God. And I'm thinking, if that's not outright heresy. And what shocks me is that the church, the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, doesn't say a thing about that. They don't stand up to this guy and say, what are you doing? What are you saying? The whole proclamation of our mission is to tell people about Jesus, that there's no other name and given among heaven that men can be saved by except the Lord Jesus Christ, and you just came and erased everything. So the church is in big trouble. The Roman Catholic Church is in very big trouble. And so, gosh, you can understand that during the Protestant Reformation, when they were writing their uh, doctrinal statement under Antichrist, they would name the current pope. And they would say he was Antichrist. Why? Because he's killing Christians and persecuting others. So it is really sad to see what uh, the situation is in the Catholic Church. I've mentioned this before. How many of you have seen the movie Searchlight? Okay. You, you probably have to uh, rent it online. It's probably three or four bucks. But it stars Michael Keaton in it. And he is a journalist. And they start off with discovering what's going on in the Archdiocese of Boston and a tremendous over two, three hundred priests in the area have been moved and other priests have been moved into their area and they have all had a reported a time of absence because of sickness. And they trace it all back to find out that these priests 
have been sexually abusing children. True story. And instead of dealing with it, they just moved them on to another church. And that's why the church has been sued for millions and millions and millions of dollars. And kids' faith have been damaged because of the abuse of the Catholic Church. So it's kind of an investigative journalism story, but I can't hear you. Yes. Yeah, did, what did I say? Yeah, so they've paid millions of dollars to damages. And they had a whole court system and a legal fund set up to handle those cases, do it quietly, write them a check, send them on their way. But this case kind of broke everything open. So Catholicism, Roman Catholicism as it stands now, is in real trouble. All of these identifications have proved false, and it is likely yet worse than the man of lawlessness who is going to come. Isn't that interesting? That's his name, the man of lawlessness. Translated in the original Greek, Kamala Harris. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Will arise on the world scene and bring unparalleled suffering and persecution to be destroyed by Jesus when he comes. But evil penetrated by many of these other rulers has been so great that at least while they were in power, it would have been difficult to be certain that the man of lawlessness mentioned in Thessalonians has not yet appeared. So as lawlessness increases, it still hasn't fully happened here. I find it interesting politically that even in the state of California, the mayor of Oakland lost her mayoral race and was removed. The mayor of San Francisco, uh, London, has been removed. Now, again, Democrats have replaced, but nevertheless, lawlessness. That's what the sign of the time is, and that's what's going on. And thank God that it's been removed. So isn't that kind of strange? We as believers are looking for someone who is going to be lawless, but we as believers also don't want lawlessness, right? So we're standing against the tide in one sense. Questions? Anybody? Pay attention. That's exactly right. That's what that's what Peter says. Pay attention. Yeah. Can't. Well, we look for Christ, but these are all signs of how it's going to go. So he is letting you know that there is going to be a time when you see these things be ready. So but yeah, I'm not looking for the lawless one in particular. Uh, I'm looking for Jesus Christ to return. And that's that's the most exciting thing. So good point. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Dale. Right. Well, we don't know the specific time or the day or the day or the season. Nobody knows. But he's saying, be ready. And that's what this is about. Imminent preparation for how we live day in and day out. So there's one sense we're not in the end times. There's another sense that we got one foot in the end times. So that should make us more fervent in our zeal to tell others about Jesus and to uh, get about the gospel mandate. <clears throat> Some people have gone so far to store food under their beds, you know, the, the all that uh, dehydrated food. And, I talked to one guy I know. He's got 25 years worth of food in storage. Yeah. <laughs> What's that guy's name and where does he live, right? Okay. The salvation of all Israel. With regard to the salvation of all Israel, because that's what the Bible says, it most likely indicates that there will be yet a future massive ingathering of Jewish people that turn to Messiah. But it's not certain that Romans 9 and 11 predicts this, and many have argued that no further ingathering of Jesus' people will occur. Jewish people 
will occur beyond the kind that we have already seen in thousands of Jewish people have trusted Jesus as their Messiah throughout the history of the church. But if you read 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, there's going to be a lot more Jews that come to know the Lord. So when the fullness of the Gentiles is done, and that's what the language Paul uses, so God began to do his work with uh, Gentile or Jewish people. And in uh, Genesis chapter 12, at the call of Abraham, God, well, that's a lousy 12. God calls him and establishes a people and then all the way to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he lives for some 30 to 33 years, right? Then there is this massive ingathering and a time of the church age, which is the Gentile age. Nobody saw that coming. Yet in Jesus' ministry, many people who were non-Jewish came to know him, right? The Samaritan woman. Uh, in Paul's time, it was, you know, take like the Philippian jailer, take like the visions that he had. It was a time that Paul said of the Gentiles. Yet at the end time, there is going to be a mass salvation of Jews that come at the end time. And we, as the church, Paul uses the illustration of a tree, right? An olive tree. I know that's not much of an olive tree. <laughs> but um, we have, as Gentiles, been grafted in. And the roots of this tree are Judaism, the law and the prophets. But he gives a warning in Corinthians, and he basically says, you need to understand, you've been grafted in. They've been removed, but God can take you out again. Not that you can lose your salvation, but in terms of the people that he's working with. So these Jews here, there'll be a time of great movement when they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, you know what a tree graft is, right? Sometimes you go around the tree, you'll see a big knot down here at the bottom. That, that means that that tree has been grafted in. They do that because they've got a healthy root system, but they don't like the product that it's producing up here, so they've grafted in what they want. So you can end up getting a healthy rootstock and a healthy fruit. They do that in viticulture too. And you'll see if you drive around, you look at pistachios and almond trees, sometimes you'll see a big knot around the bottom. It means it's been grafted in. Do you guys have grafted trees on your property at all? You do? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so conclusion. Except for spectacular signs in the heaven, it is unlikely but possible that all these signs have been fulfilled. Okay? If you're looking at the signs, is it possible they've all been fulfilled? Yes. But we have not seen the miraculous signs in the skies. Moreover, the only sign that seems certain not to have occurred is the darkening of the sun, the moon, the falling of the stars could occur within the space of a few minutes. And therefore, it seems appropriate to say that Christ could now return at any hour, day, and night. Right? It is therefore unlikely, but certainly possible, that Christ can return at any time. And what he means there is unlikely because the major signs haven't happened yet. But be ready. But does this position do justice to the warnings that we should be ready and that Christ is coming at a time we do not expect? Is it possible to be ready for something that we think is unlikely to happen in the future? Sure. Everyone wears a seatbelt, right? Well, what do you wear a seatbelt for? Well, because if you don't, you get a ticket. That was, that was my last ticket. I dumped some stuff off the dump, and I got back on 46, and I had just forgotten to buckle my seatbelt, and I mean, boo, pulled me right over. I think it was like 85, 90 bucks. But you wear a seatbelt for safety be, in case you are in an accident. Right? So just like you wear a seatbelt or purchase auto insurance to get ready for an event you think is unlikely to happen, 
In a similar way, it's possible to take serious warnings that Jesus would come when we're not expecting him and nonetheless to say that the signs preceding his coming will probably yet occur in the future. So be ready because it can happen at any moment. I mean, we don't know just because we don't know who the Antichrist is, just because we don't know everything that's going on doesn't mean that he cannot return. This position has a positive spiritual benefit to seek to live the Christian life in the midst of a rapidly changing world. In the ebb and flow of world history, we see from time to time events that could be the final fulfillment of some of these signs, right? I mean, World War II was pretty bad, was it not? I mean, over 60 million people killed. But think about it, the next world war that takes place. How different is the world now, especially with nuclear power, right? They can accomplish what took Hitler 13 years to build and to do with a moment in time. Just to give you an idea of how devastating the nuclear situation could be, you've got North Korea, you've got Iran, and the only reason why they haven't let one of those things go is because they know if they do, that'll be the end of their country. That will literally flatten them. But millions and millions of people can be killed. How many of you remember Chernobyl in uh, 1985 when they actually built a containment over the uh, third nuclear reactor that was there, the RKBM reactor, they have built a containment field over it because they didn't want it to escape. They're now constructing a new containment area and they're going to slide it over the old one because the old one's about ready to fail. But I don't remember what the half-life of uranium-238 is, but it's thousands of years. So they're saying every hundred years or so, they're going to have to construct it and put a containment over it because it's going to destroy the land around them. So that's powerful when you think about that. And that's just in one little area. There's a great series if you want to watch it. I think it's an HBO production. So you got to be cautious because of the language and stuff. But it's just simply called Chernobyl. And it's a five, six part series. Fascinating on how the Russians uh, built these reactors under the false idea that you could push a button and it would shut everything down. And it, uh huh. Yeah, right. And, and those are thousands of times in less power than what we have now. Yeah. And that's a scary thought, isn't it, to, to think that. Uh, so notice this. They'll happen when they fade away during the blackest of days of World War II. They looked at Hitler as the Antichrist. During the times of persecution against the church, it seemed more likely that Christians are in the middle of the Great Tribulation when we hear of earthquakes, famines, wars, make us wonder if the coming of Christ might be near. Then these events fade into the background and the world leaders pass off the scene and the tide of events leading to the end of the age seem to have receded, right? It's that line I drove here. Well, boy, we're going to, and then it goes back down and then up again and then up again and up again, down again, and each time it like waves growing in intensity. Once again, the new wave of events will break on the world scene, and once again, our expectation of Christ's return is increased. With each successive wave of events, we do not know which one will be the last. And it's good because God does not intend us to know. He simply wants us to continue to long for Christ's return and to expect that it could occur at any time. It is spiritually unhealthy for us to say we know that the signs have not occurred. And it seems to stretch the bounds of the credible interpretation to saying that we know that these signs have occurred. So be very careful. Some, yes, possible. But we can't know for certain. 
It seems to fit exactly in the middle of the New Testament approach towards Christ's return to say that we do not know with certainty if any of these events have already occurred, right? But we have to re always fall back to responsible exegesis. That means inter interpreting your Bible correctly. We have to fall back to the expectation of Christ's sudden return and a measure of humility in our understanding. So that's why when I'm teaching this, and we're going to get into the different views of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, because when he returns here, right, there is going to be a tribulation period that's going to take place for seven years. Some people believe that there is going to be a secret rapture that takes place here where the church is removed and we do not go through the tribulation. There are others who believe that Jesus will return halfway in the tribulation. And there are others who believe that there's only a first coming and a second coming of Jesus right here after the tribulation. And I teach all three of these points of view. And I let you, I mean, I'll tell you what I believe, but I let you determine to the best of your ability what you believe it is. I don't force it. I don't mandate it. I don't push it on anybody because we just ultimately don't know. And I don't want to go around saying I know everything. The Bible just doesn't give us that. So if Christ does return suddenly, we will not be tempted to object even mentally, saying that all the signs or another sign is to occur. We simply be ready to welcome him when he appears. And if great suffering is yet to come, and if we begin to intense opposition to the gospel, a large revival among the Jewish people, remarkable progress in the preaching of the gospel throughout the world, even spectacular signs in heavens, will not be dismayed or lose heart because we remember Jesus' words when these things have begun to take place. Straighten up, rise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Amen. Okay, questions? Yeah. Well, yeah, pre-wrath is, and it's there's post-trib, and there's a pre-wrath position that takes place here. That just means that Christ comes just before the final outpouring of his wrath on that timetable. So, so many views, we'll get into all those, and then you can decide which one. Okay, well, I think we should probably stop here because the next one I'm going to do is preterism, and I've got a handout for that. Um, you probably have never heard of preterism before. You have? Okay. But we'll give you a, a little deal on that. Yeah, so I'll give you this next time. Or, or do you want them now? Next time. That way you don't have to worry about bringing your paper and forgetting it and Pastor Mike being all upset at you because you forgot your paper. <laughs> yeah. So are you, are you finding this helpful? You sure? Okay. Because I, I just don't. Okay. So same here. Good. Can't You're on the same page as me. Yes, yeah. so we do it on the second and on the fourth Saturday. So this is the second Saturday. We will do it on the 23rd, all right? And Thanksgiving falls on the 28th this year, so we'll be fine. We don't have to worry about that. Let you know that there, for those of you who uh, don't want to have to cook a massive Thanksgiving dinner, you don't have to. You can come to the church. We're having one. We usually have 100, 150 people here. Or just, you know, be like my wife and just say, I'm not cooking a full turkey anymore. We'll just go to the church and let somebody else cook the turkey. I'll bring the turkey, but I ain't cooking one. <laughs> and so, anyway, we, we have an ongoing theological discussion in our house. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Because I said, I said to her, she does two things for Thanksgiving that I absolutely love. One, she makes homemade bread. Oh, so good. And the second thing is, is we save some turkey breast, and I carve that, and I put it on a, that white bread, 
with Miracle Whip. And okay, oh, hey, 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 hey. John, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I put the Miracle Whip on there. I put a, bit, a little bit of the Lori season salt on there, a glass of milk, and I'm in heaven. Yeah, so as long as you cook a turkey breast, honey, I'm fine. You make bread and turkey breast, we're good. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your promises of your return. And even today, Lord, we look with expectation because you could come at any hour. There's some stuff that we hasn't been revealed yet, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen so quick. And so, Lord, we bless you and we thank you and we look forward to the day when we will be together and like the disciples on that mount of transgression, look into your beautiful face, the beatific vision, what we long for, to see Jesus and his splendor and his glory. John says we shall see him, we shall be like him, and we shall see him. What a joy that is. So may we long for that day. And as we pray, we pray as John did, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Okay.